Hello, and welcome to the Juniper Networks Learning Bytes series. I'm Josh McKenzie, a content developer with Juniper Education Services. And today we're going to be introducing containers and more specifically, Docker. So after successfully completing this content, you will have learned a brief history of virtual machines and containers, the advantages of using container-based infrastructure for your applications. We'll go over the fundamentals of Docker, including how to install Docker and how to deploy a simple Docker container. So to really understand Docker, you need to understand containers. And to understand containers, we need to understand how application infrastructure has evolved to the point where containers are now replacing virtual machines. So in the 2000s, VMs began to really rapidly replace bare metal servers as the backing infrastructure for applications and services. And there were a lot of reasons for this. Uh, first being that virtual machines allowed us to more efficiently use our available resources. So rather than having one bare metal server dedicated to a service where you might only be using a portion of the resources available on that server, and where if you needed to scale out or scale down that server, that involved replacing equipment. Whereas if you can run multiple virtual machines on the same bare metal hardware, you can really extract every ounce of available resources out of that hardware. Virtual machines also through their portability are very flexible. Uh, they're very easy to pick up and move around, send them over the internet. You don't need to put them on a truck and send them somewhere. This makes our scaling much more flexible, introduces the possibility for dynamic scaling where we can actually scale resources automatically based on demand, all of which would be very difficult or impossible with traditional bare metal. We also saw monolithic applications where all of the processes involved in providing a service rested on one piece of bare metal, moving towards modular services, where we break up the various components of a application into smaller service packages. Each one runs in its own virtual machine, which allows us to independently scale the various tiers of an application. Now in the 2010s and beyond, this really picked up, especially around 2013, 2014, containers have started replacing virtual machines. And really containers offer a lot of the same advantages of virtual machines. A lot of the impetus for moving to containers is actually the same motivating factors that moved us from bare metal to virtual machines. Containers just do a lot of those things even better. So containers have even lower overhead compared to virtual machines. And we'll see why that is here in a moment but they allow us to use our resources even more efficiently than virtual machines do. Uh, containers, just by their very nature, boot very quickly in a matter of seconds, as opposed to generally a few minutes for virtual machines. So if we're talking about dynamic scaling, scaling out the number of instances of a particular service component automatically in response to demand, when it only takes a second or two to boot up an instance as opposed to a few minutes, you can see the advantages to that are quite obvious. We've also seen the move from modular services, or rather the move into modular services becoming even more extreme, where microservices really is now the infrastructure paradigm of choice for most large applications, where we try to break up our applications into individual services that do only one very specific thing and do that very well. Now this has advantages for developers, where developers can focus on one specific service, leaving the management of dependencies and interconnectivity to other interests. This also allows us to independently version, scale, and migrate all of the different components of a service independently. So if I need to scale out just the database tier of an application, or if I need to update the database tier, I can do that without affecting other tiers of the application, providing the interfaces between them remain constant. So there are a lot of advantages to this, but that approach really leaves us with a desire to be able to run a large number of very small instances of our services, and that's where containers really shine. This was part of why we used VMs originally. Containers just do that a lot better. So a little bit about the history of containers, because this really is sort of an instance of something old becoming new again. So if you follow the lineage of the modern container, you can trace it all the way back to 1979, where the ch root functionality was first developed uh, for the Unix operating system. And this introduced file system level isolation, where different processes 
could have their own independent, isolated view of the file system. So they could actually read and write to the file system without interfering with or being interfered by other processes. Uh, this was officially incorporated into the Unix kernel in 1982. Then, whole 20 years later, we saw the development of namespaces. This was now in the Linux kernel. These were introduced in 2002. And these expanded that isolation to actually work at multiple levels. So namespaces allow us to create isolated process spaces in addition to file system spaces and network spaces, where if you're coming from the network world, Linux network namespaces are very similar to uh, VRFs or RIBs. In 2007, a couple engineers at Google developed control groups and control groups in combination with namespaces are really what make modern containers possible. Control groups allow the Linux kernel, without any additional hypervisor, to manage resource allocations between large numbers of processes, each running in their own isolated namespaces. So we end up with a capability that is similar to what we achieve with operating system level virtualization through virtual machines, but with a lot less overhead. This is all handled by the kernel itself. There's no additional hypervisor process involved. Since that time, new tool sets have emerged to simplify management of containers. So if you look at something like LXC, Docker, or CoreOS's Rocket, these are container runtimes, and these aren't what actually create containers. Containers are namespaces and control groups. You can manually create containers through native Linux kernel commands. However, it's actually very difficult to do so. It requires a lot of in-depth knowledge of the Linux kernel. They're not particularly easy to manage. So what these tool sets, these container runtimes provide, are a simplified interface to these capabilities. LXC has a focus mostly on operating system level virtualization, so something very much like virtual machines. Docker, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, as it is the most popular container runtime, has a large focus on portability and packaging. So we want to make it very easy to develop and deploy an application on one piece of infrastructure and use that same image to deploy it anywhere. There's also a lot of great tool sets out there that use Docker as their backing container runtime. CoreOS Rocket is an alternative to Docker that has more of a focus on security. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on Docker. Now to solidify our understanding of containers, let's take a look at how containers compare to virtual machines, which should be a fairly familiar concept. As we've discussed, containers have similar resource isolation and allocation benefits to VMs. They just happen to be more efficient and more portable. And the really top line here is that containers don't need a nested guest operating system or a hypervisor. So if we look at the left-hand side of this slide, you can see an example of a virtual machine deployment. So we have at the bottom our host operating system. Over top of that, we have the hypervisor which is gonna be responsible for coordinating access to our underlying system hardware and operating system resources between our virtual machines. Now, each virtual machine has a copy of its own guest operating system. This is operating system level virtualization. Over top of that, we install any libraries, configs, any dependencies for our application, and then the actual application process or processes. By comparison with containers, we have our host operating system, but instead of a hypervisor, we now have the Docker process. This just runs like any other process on the operating system. Then our containers are just isolated processes that all share that same underlying operating system kernel. And the OS itself is actually responsible for allocating resources between all of those different application process instances. So rather than having the same guest operating system repeated over and over and over again for each VM, or having this extra layer of processing power required in the form of a hypervisor, we're just running processes directly on top of the native operating system. As a result, containers gain at least a 30% increase in efficiency, depending on how efficiently the VMs were built that we're comparing to here. That can be a lot more than 30%. We can get even 70, 80% increases in efficiency by moving from virtual machines to containers. So now that we've discussed containers broadly, let's move on to talking about Docker specifically. So Docker really is the most popular of the container runtimes, sort of a de facto standard. 
Uh, really, ultimately, what Docker does is make your Linux containers really easy to use. Also has a great tool set around packaging to make it easy to develop applications on one system and easily deploy them across a very large number of different systems. Docker comes in two editions, community and enterprise. The big difference with the enterprise edition, you get some tools that are really going to be specifically useful in very large environments, things like uh, better securing your images, for instance. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on the community edition. Docker uses a client server architecture. So all of the actual functionality is provided by the Docker D process, which is our server that exposes a REST API. When we're interacting with Docker through the CLI, we're actually just using a client that is using that REST API. Other tools that rely on Docker as their backend, such as Kubernetes, which we'll discuss in a future learning byte, interact with the Docker process through that same REST API. Some important concepts here for Docker. So a running Docker process is called a Docker container. So that is the actual process that's providing whatever service we're looking to run. We can create containers based on Docker images. So that allows us to record all of the properties required to spin up a Docker container. There are actually a couple ways we can create an image. On this slide, we're showing using a Docker file, which we'll actually discuss in more detail in a later learning byte to define a Docker image. We can also capture images based on currently running containers with the Docker commit command. Then if we want to share and distribute images to others or even to ourselves across different systems, we can do so by pushing our images up to the Docker Hub. Docker Hub has three options for managing images. We have private channels, which are subscription-based. We have public, where we can just publish our images and anyone can use them. This is free. There are also official Docker Hub channels or repositories. Uh, and these are owned by major vendors like Python, Nginx, Ubuntu, et cetera. The naming conventions are gonna be slightly different, but we can access public and official images for free. If you want to have a private repository that will require a subscription. So next, we're actually gonna walk through the process of installing Docker. And then we are going to spin up a simple Docker container and look at a couple common commands for viewing our containers and our images. We have a couple options for installing Docker. The simplest method is going to be to go straight to the Docker GitHub repository at github.com slash Docker. And inside of there, they have a repo called Docker install. And this is actually just a link to a script that will install Docker for you on your choice of target system. Now, Docker inherently relies on the features of the Linux kernel. So you install Docker on a Linux system. That being said, there is a Docker desktop package for Windows. This actually works by installing a set of Linux tools onto Windows to actually run Docker. I would recommend, it is generally recommended, in fact, to run Docker on a Linux system. You can run into definitely some issues trying to run Docker on Windows. For this example, we're going to install Docker on an Ubuntu system. This will be Ubuntu 16. I'm just going to go ahead and grab this download link here, go into my Ubuntu system and just grab that shell script. Easy, no pain here. And then we're going to go ahead and run that. So this script really makes things very easy. It will detect which Linux distribution you're currently running. We'll find the uh, latest community edition package for that instance and install it along with any of the dependencies required. All right, so now that we've installed Docker, we can verify that it is working by running Docker version. You can see the current version of Docker installed. Next, we're gonna go ahead and spin up a simple Docker image. So for this example, we're gonna be using the Hello World image. You can find this in the Docker Hub website, searching for Hello World. And this is just an image to quickly demonstrate how a Docker container is actually spun up. So we're gonna use this Docker pull command to first grab that image and store it locally. We can use Docker image list to see currently saved images in our local cache. You can see just that hello world image present. 
Now we can go ahead and run it. So we'll run Docker run, hello world. And what this image actually does is just print out a string that describes the process of spinning up a container. So you can see that to generate this message, first the Docker client, that's our CLI, contacted the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon pulled the hello world image. In this case, we pulled it ahead of time. The Docker daemon created a new container from that image, runs as an executable and produces the output we're currently reading and then streams that output to the Docker client, which in turn sends it to our terminal. This also provides us a option to do something a little bit more ambitious. One thing you should notice is that we are now back at our Linux bash prompt. I can view currently running containers with Docker container list. And as you'll see, there are no containers currently running. By default, Docker containers are ephemeral. They will run the process defined within them and then close. If instead we wanted to run a persistent process, we could use the detached option. We'll cover that in a future learning byte. We can also, if we want to interact directly with the process inside the container, we can use something like this using the IT option, which will open an interactive terminal. Docker run, IT, Ubuntu, bash. So this is going to open up a terminal to a Ubuntu container, and this is actually the official Ubuntu container running the bash process, which is the shell. So the process here will be the same. Going to go download that Ubuntu image, which is what's happening right now. Once it's downloaded, it's going to go ahead and run it. Notice our command prompt is now changed. The host name is a randomly generated host name that contains the ID of our container. We can see, however, inside of here, that this is being treated just like another Linux operating system. So that concludes our introduction to containers with Docker Learning Byte. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you for the next one. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology-specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.